I'm H.W. Brands. I teach history here at the University of Texas. I have large classes of undergraduates. I have some graduate students, and I see some of my students in the audience today. So I'm delighted for you all to be here. I'm going to be talking about the history of the U.S. dollar. I wrote a book on this subject, so I sort of think I know something about it, but the more I think I know about it, sometimes the less sure I am of what I think I know. But before I get into the history of the dollar, I'm going to do a magic trick. And this is a trick that is as old as the Republic, but it happens every day. So I need a prop. Here's my prop. This is a piece of paper. It has Andrew Jackson's picture on it. And Jackson is having one of the great hair days in American history. <laughs> this piece of paper is a little bit over six inches long. And it's, it's very nice paper. The paper is very durable. But even so, the paper is probably worth intrinsically about four cents. It has some very fine artwork, some of the best engravers in the country did their work to produce both the front and the back of this. And the ink is as high quality as ink gets. And there are a few extra properties here that make it difficult to reproduce this unauthorizedly. But even so, the total value of this thing, if you put in everything that goes into this, might be a nickel. Okay? So this is worth a nickel. But if I take it to the local Domino's or to Double Dave's or Pizza Store, and I order a great big pizza, and the pizza costs $20, I can give this five cent piece of paper to the cashier at the pizza place, and the cashier is going to hand me this pizza that is intrinsically worth a whole lot more than this piece of paper. Now, if you ask me, that is magic. How does it happen? Ah, there's a special formula. In fact, there's a magic phrase that makes this happen. And the magic phrase is right here on the front of this piece of paper. Any of you know what the magic phrase is? And there are two words. The two words are not presto changeo, and they're not abracadabra. In fact, they are a more powerful magic formula than that. Do any of you know what those two words are? Yes. Legal tender. Legal tender. There is a phrase on the front that says, a sentence, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. You know what legal tender means? It means that if I walk into that pizza store, and they're advertising this big double pizza for sale for $20, and I hand them one of these, they have to take it. They can't say, no, I don't like that money. We, and we're going to insist on something else. Legal tender means that if I owe a debt, I can give my creditor this in repayment of that debt, and the creditor has to take it. Now, that is magic. How was it accomplished? When did it first happen? Well, that's the story I'm going to get to. I'll put away my prop, and I'll tell you a little bit about the kinds of money that this country has had. We'll start with, we'll start with independence, because before independence, there's stuff that goes back into British imperial history. But in 1792, Congress passed the Coinage Act of 1792, and it specified that the United States dollar was going to be based on, can you guess what it was based on? Gold. The United States dollar was going to be based on gold, but it also allowed that a dollar could be based on silver. And this was a problem. It was a problem because to say that a dollar is so many grams of gold and so many grams of silver, well, what happens if gold and silver shift in value relative to each other. In fact, that's exactly what happened over time. And it was very difficult for, it was very difficult for Congress and the American, 
financial system to keep the gold and silver in balance. And there was a bigger problem than that. And the problem goes to the reason that we have money at all. Money arises as a way of lubricating the economy. In fact, one good rule of thumb definition for money is it's the grease that makes the economy run. And if you use that analogy, you can, without pushing it too far, you can see that if you have not enough grease, if there's not enough grease, then the economy gets sticky and it doesn't operate very well and it grinds to a halt. On the other hand, you can sometimes have too much grease and the grease spills out all over everything and the machinery gets going too fast. So the trick of managing a money supply is to make sure that you have just enough grease but not too much. So why did people, why did people set on gold and silver as a form of money? What, what advantages do gold and silver have? Gold is, has long been considered the best standard for money. What's the advantage of gold? Well, the basic advantage of gold is there's not very much of it. Because if you're going to have a money system, you don't want there to be too many pieces of whatever you call them floating around. The other thing about gold is it's rare, but there are other things that are rare. It's very durable. And here's something to think about. Within a rough approximation, all the gold that has ever been dug out of the ground from ancient times until the present still exists as gold. This isn't something you can say about most minerals. If you, you steal, rust, silver tarnishes, but gold remains. And if you took all the gold that has ever been dug out of the ground and refined, it's still around. So you like that if you're piling up gold coins. There's a problem, though, and that is how much gold is enough? Starting in colonial times, continuing into the early national period, Americans discovered that there wasn't enough gold to run the economy. And so they resorted to paper. And the original paper dollars were not issued by the US government. They were issued by state governments initially, but the Constitution of 1787 disallowed that. There were notes that were issued by banks. And it would say, the Bank of Texas says this is worth $5. And if you believe the Bank of Texas, then you'd accept it for $5. Keep this in mind, because this question of belief, this is at the heart of any money system, regardless of whether it's based on paper, gold, silver, or something else. If people believe that money is worth something, then it's worth something. And if people lose their belief, that it's worth what it says it is, then it's at risk. Gold and silver were the basis of the American money system until 1862. Gold and silver had been enough when augmented by the paper money that was issued by the various banks. Because the paper money was almost like checks, where because people didn't want to carry gold around in their pockets, because people needed more currency than just that, they would accept these notes, believing that the banks would be able to redeem them at face value. But people discounted these bank notes for the reliability of the bank and the distance from the bank. So if you were in Texas and somebody wanted to hand you a $5 note from the Bank of Connecticut, you might say, oh, I don't want that because the Bank of Connecticut's a long way away. And what was the magic formula on the $20 bill that I put out? Legal tender. These bills were not legal tender. You didn't have to accept them. You could if you wanted to, but you didn't have to. Along comes the Civil War. And the government of the United States and the government of the Confederate States both realized that there were greater demands on the governments for expenditures to fight the war than they had money for. And each one was inclined to print more money. The Confederate states printed money, and they succumbed to the temptation that it has always been the reason that people distrust paper money. What's the problem of paper money? What's the problem with this 
paper note that I have? Who made it? Well, somebody at the Department of the Treasury made this. What's the disadvantage that this has in that regard with respect to gold? Who made gold? Well, you can say God made gold or gold originated however gold originates, but people can't make more of it. This was, this has always been the temptation of governments when they produce paper money and when they make it legal tender, when they make you accept it. We're going to take a break now and I'm going to come back and tell you afterwards what happened after this legal tender was first created.